I think many of you have been here before uh, for the opening of our Kubrick Symposium. The whole weekend we celebrate, of course, 50 years of 2001 A Space Odyssey by Stanley Kubrick, accompanying our big Jubilee exhibition here at Deutsches Filmmuseum, lasting until the 23rd of September, Kubrick's 2001 50 Years of A Space Odyssey. And it's my a great pleasure and honor to introduce to you our next guest and speaker. Uh, we have Dr. James Fenwick from Leicester University here, and he will talk in a couple of minutes about a transmedia odyssey, Marvel Comics, and the expansion of the 2001 Space Odyssey universe. Maybe some of, some of you who've been to our exhibition have already noticed that on the wall, uh, besides the staircase uh, downwards to the cinema, uh, you find uh, a wall covered with all, uh, with the entirety all the Jack Kirby Marvel comics, so they're on display in our exhibition here as well. In 1976, Marvel Comics published a curious adaptation of 2001 A Space Odyssey, and that comic series utilized the narrative devices of 2001 as a way of introducing a range of new superhero characters and to widen the film's narrative universe, says James Fenwick. The adaptation continued the tradition of the film's transmedia identity as well as furthering audience understanding of 2001. And James will explore this Marvel comic series as well as reflect on his own 2001 fandom, a film he describes as having led to a love affair with the films of this great director and of the whole of cinema. James Fanwick has published a number of articles and book chapters on Kubrick and just recently co-edited two special Kubrick issues for Synergy and the Historical Journal of Film, Radio and Television. Um, and we will present his new edited uh, book, Understanding Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, published by Intellect, which just, just uh, came out some weeks ago, and which is also available at the museum's bookshop. And we will have a short discussion, a book presentation with a panel with other contributors and with James as being the editor of this wonderful book uh, after the Q&A, after his talk. James Fenwick was awarded funding by the European Association of American Studies in 2017 to undertake research on Kirk Douglas, and he is currently working on a book called Stanley Kubrick Produces, which explores Kubrick's role as a producer. And I'm very pleased, and it is a great honor that you have accepted our invitation, especially today, because today is James' birthday. And for this very special occasion, uh, James just came down uh, from uh, Leicester to us this morning, we've prepared, of course, a little clip from the classic from Kubrick's 2001. Happy birthday, James. Uh, we're very happy to have you here uh, on your birthday. And as I promised you, we have here um, a special uh, German beer for your talk. Uh, <laughs> and it comes uh, with a German cheesecake on the side. So um, I'm very welcome. Please join me on his birthday, James Fenwick. Uh, thank you very much. I'm a bit concerned because it doesn't turn out very well uh, for Frank, as we all know. I'm also a bit concerned, is this like a oh to Dr. Strange love maybe with a cheesecake? I don't know. Um, I'll put it over here so don't drop it. <laughs> um, can I just firstly thank uh, Niels and the team here at the museum for organising uh, this symposium uh, and this opportunity to celebrate 2001 A Space Odyssey on its 50th anniversary. And I think also a chance to celebrate Kubrick on what would have been his 90th uh, birthday this, is it next weekend or whenever, 28th of July, but basically the 90th year of his birth. Um, what I also want to do before I begin is kind of just say what I'm not going to do with this talk. So I'm not going to talk about how fantastic 2001 Space Odyssey is. I'm not going to kind of assert its cinematic uh, kind of importance or its kind of status as a masterpiece. Um, others have done that, Peter Kramer amongst them. Um, so I'm not going to bother, okay? I'll let them do that. Um, no, instead what I'm going to do today is talk about the Marvel comics and this idea of fandom. And when I talk about fandom, I literally mean the act of being a fan, okay? And I want to think about what it means to be a fan of Kubrick and a fan of 2001. And the centre of this talk, as I say, will be the Marvel comics, uh, a ten-part uh, series based on 2001 Space Odyssey. And it's going to be looking at the comics through this lens of fandom. 
And then I want to consider the origins of the comics and the ways in which fans engage with them. And this would be by basically looking at fan letters that were submitted to the comics. Um, but I first want to dwell, dwell on 2001 The Film and my own fandom. And I want to say something that is going to be very controversial, given this audience. And that is that I find 2001 A Space Odyssey utterly boring. I'll leave that there for a minute, okay? Um, I'll qualify the remarks. Um, so when I say it's, I find it boring, it's not to say that I don't think it is an incredible film, but rather that I find the film purposely pushes me away. It forces me to contemplate the passage of time, to recognise that events on screen are occurring at a monotonous rate, and to confront and to question what I'm seeing, what I am not seeing, and most importantly, what I want to see. So the problem is this, I have seen the film so many times. This year alone, I've already seen it three times, okay? And so I can recite what little dialogue there is moments before it happens on screen. Um, I anticipate the next image in the film and I sway in sync with the music. I know 2001 inside and out. And I'm sure that is the same for all of you here. Firstly, can I just double check, you all have seen 2001, haven't you? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, so basically, I find that it offers no unique viewing experience anymore. And I know that that remark might draw some kind of criticism from some people, but for me, it doesn't, okay? Other than the indulgence of going to a special screening of the film and to re-watch it as part of a select group of cinephiles who, as I say, I'm sure have seen the film many, many times. So what are they getting out of the experience and understanding of its narrative universe? Sorry, no, I got that wrong. What are they getting out of it and what other ways beyond watching the film do they interact with 2001 to expand their experience and understanding of its narrative universe? So these are the questions that I'm going to explore today when I move on to discuss the Marvel comics. And I hope that by the end of this talk, you will start to think about and discuss 2001 in a very different way, perhaps in a way similar to which I'm going to talk about it. So let me tell you about my own first encounter with 2001. Indeed, my first encounter with Kubrick and we have to go back in time a little bit, okay? So it's March 1999, and that is a day that I'm sure for Kubrick fans, they recognize what happened then. Kubrick died, okay, March 7th, 1999. Um, I wasn't really conscious of the fact at the time, I was only 11 years old. What I do vividly remember about those days immediately after Kubrick's death is that a friend brought a battered copy of Arthur C. Clarke's novel, 2001, A Space Odyssey, with him to school. I remember him showing me the book in science class and asking me if, he knew, if I knew anything about it, and in particular, uh, the other name of the person on the book, Stanley Kubrick. I didn't have a chance to reply before our science teacher, Mr. Cartwright, represented here uh, from Pink Floyd's The Wall. He didn't really look like this. Um, he was an intimidating Victorian figure with a short temper, and he interrupted our conversation and demanded in front of the class to know what we were talking about. He stole the book from my hands and muttered disapprovingly under his breath. My voice shaking, I raised my hand in the air and dared to ask, Who, sir, is Stanley Kubrick? Mr Cartwright was quiet for a moment. His beady eyes burnt into me. His face was red with irritation. Finally, he snapped back. Nobody important. Some film director. Very boring. Very controversial. Never, ever watch his films. Now, what do you do? If a teacher tells you not to do something, you do the exact opposite. And so my interest in Kubrick had been piqued. I do apologise. If Mr. Carter ever sees this, he doesn't look like this at all. He's, he's a lot bigger. Um, <laughs> so it wasn't until a couple of years later, 2001 in fact, that I finally was exposed to the film. It was on cable television, partway through the Dawn of Man sequence, and it baffled me. I couldn't work out what the film was about, whether these were men in monkey costume or real apes. But most of all, I was enthralled. Something about it kept me watching, and I wanted to know more. So at this time, uh, the Warner Brothers, um, sorry, Warner Brothers, in collaboration with the Kubrick estate, specifically Tony Fruin, established a Stanley Kubrick website. And I know I've bothered Georgina about this, but this website kind of obsesses me. This is roughly what it looked like. It's a poor attempt to recreate it. But this website, you can basically hover over pictures of the films and it bring up a, like a synopsis. And I was obsessed. I wanted to spend hours on this website, like learning about the films. Um, 
And basically, my request is, if anyone remembers anything about this website, if they know anywhere where it's archived, if they've got screenshots, please come talk to me, because I want to write something about it. Um, the only thing I can find is stuff by Tony Fruin in the archive that kind of details uh, what Warner Brothers intended to create with this website. Anyway, I've, I've got sidetracked there. So I spent hours on this website looking at the posters for each of Kubrick's films and reading the synopses. And I endeavoured to watch every film. And so, with my weekly pocket money, I purchased each one on DVD. And they came in a white cardboard sleeve case with striking artwork designs. Now, I'm sure, again, Kubrick fans will be very familiar with these DVDs. And these, they probably look really primitive nowadays, but they are my most treasured Kubrick item. Okay, There's something about the artwork, the striking kind of white border that really connects me with the films in a way that the re-releases don't. Okay, There's something about these simple uh, cardboard sleeve DVDs. So I reg regularly peruse my growing Kubrick collection and moreover, repeatedly watch his films. And so, I'm sorry, what am I doing now? And so while my friends were more interested in the yearly Lord of the Rings releases or the Tyson prequel Star Wars trilogy, I was devoted to Kubrick and to collecting all things Kubrick. From books and posters to film prints and interviews, my Kubrick fandom soon grew into an obsessive cinephilia, into a love of cult film. And at the root of this cinephilia remained Kubrick, the monolith, if you will, in my love affair for cinema. I apologise for that terrible phrase. Um, but periodically I would watch each film, and still do, but with a growing sense of desensitisation, as I had grown to know them so intimately. And so I sought out further ways to engage with them, to look for ways to expand my knowledge of Kubrick and my appreciation for his art. I turned to academia. And I knew someone would laugh. Was that Peter laughing? <laughs> so I'm sure this process I'm outlining, the ways in which I now engage with Kubrick's work is familiar to many in this room. The films themselves no longer remain the sole way for me to engage with Kubrick and his movies, but rather they are a springboard to a whole range of paratexts. And I'm just going to give you a really glib kind of definition of what I mean by this phrase, paratexts. Okay? Firstly, just to say, when I say the phrase text, I mean a film. So a paratext can be seen as a subtext that supports a main text and shapes an audience perception and knowledge of that main text. Paratexts are texts that prepare us for other texts. Arthur C. Clarke's novel could be seen as a text that prepares us for the film and ultimately shapes our perception of the film. Oh, what am I doing here? So the world of Kubrick fans and cultists is fueled by an abundance of such paratextual material, old and new, from DVD re-releases, Blu-ray releases, anniversary reissues, the burgeoning Taschen book series. Indeed, one of the first books that I purchased about Kubrick was by Taschen. And it allowed me to further engage in my fandom as I regularly browsed its pages, looking at the pictures of Kubrick on the set. So prior to kind of getting this book, the films were very abstract. I didn't really know who Stanley Kubrick was. But this film suddenly connected me to 2001 in a very different way. There is Kubrick on set directing things. And it changed my worldview of how these films were being made. That there was a man there with a vision. So there's a proliferation of academic and semi-academic books uh, that I and others contribute to. These documentaries, both amateur and professional, say something like Room 237. In fact, Room 237 is a perfect example of the kind of feverish cinephilia that Kubrick attracts. And as Laura Mee says in her analysis of that film, digital techniques allow for the recreation of personal memory and the creation of new meaning and the possibility for alternative interpretations of The Shining. There are exhibitions to engage with, all you have to do is go outside and yet another Kubrick exhibition. Indeed, I've actually dabbled in uh, creating a, a Kubrick exhibition a couple of years ago, um, part of a uh, conference that I put together. I think some of you guys were there. Um, so there's a kind of a proliferation of amateur and semi-amateur exhibitions taking place around the world. There are interviews being uncovered, um, and indeed, I'm keeping track of uh, Filippo's uh, kind of social media account because it's constantly new footage being found of Kubrick and for Kubrick fans like me we engage with this kind of material in an absolutely obsessive way. I'm just going to show you a brief clip of some recent footage that was found of Kubrick and I'll briefly explain to you how I kind of like engage with this clip. If I can find it. Now you're probably thinking why on earth am I showing you this bizarre 
boring clip. Normal people, not Kubrick fans, but normal people, would have no idea the kind of importance of that clip. But for a Kubrick fan like me, it immediately shapes the way that I perceive his films. Why? Well, you get to see, for instance, the cats that are kind of littered around the room, kind of creating a personal connection to Kubrick. You get to see the fact that the, his walls are littered with kind of post-it notes. You get to understand his working methods as a director. When we say it's from 1984, you can suddenly place that between The Shining and Full Metal Jacket, the fact that he's working on projects such as AI. And it really kind of begins to kind of shape um, my own understanding of Kubrick as a man, as a visionary and as an artist. Um, so indeed, each of Kubrick's films has spawned a whole range of paratexts, with 2001 A Space Odyssey allowing fans to engage not only with the film, but with documentaries that were made at the time, um, with the 2001 books themselves written by Arthur C. Clarke, and with other texts he wrote, like The Lost Worlds of 2001, uh, the kind of unofficial sequel, if you will, by Peter Hyams, 2010, and if they so wish, the Marvel comics. And by the way, I will get to the Marvel comics shortly, don't worry. So my point here then is that when I say that I find 2001 the film utterly boring, it's because now, as a fan, I am constantly looking to alternative sources to further my understanding, appreciation and interaction with the narrative universe of that film. And as it's clear, there is an ample opportunity to do this. As Professor Ian Hunter, a renowned Kubrick cultist and the man I co-organised uh, a Kubrick ex exhibition with in 2016, sorry, a Kubrick conference with in 2016, says with specific reference to Clark's 2001 book, the novelization offers another route into the 2001 universe, an occultist should generally welcome any opportunity to expand his knowledge of occult film and thereby enhance his cultural capital. And for me, that phrase is key to understanding the Marvel comic series, another route into the 2001 universe. So I want to take you down that route with me, as I finally move on to discuss the 2001 Marvel comics. So let me set the scene for you. It's December 1976, page one of the premiere issue. Where are we going? Somewhere in the dawn of time we began. Somehow in these perilous times we keep moving on. And sometime in the future, something will happen to change us. The process of change began eons ago, with a creature called Beast Killer. Don't laugh at his name. The monolith may be the cause, it does not belong to this world. Yet it does belong to all of us. Read on and behold its awesome secrets. And so with these words and the unleashing of the beast killer creature, Marvel Comics launched the 10 part series titled 2001 A Space Odyssey, lasting from December 1976 until September 1977. All of the issues were edited, written and drawn by Marvel's Jack Kirby, the so-called king of comics. I should say, by the way, so the comics were released eight years after the release of 2001, the film. But reading the comics, it's difficult to ascertain whether one should refer to them as an adaptation of Kubrick's films or Arthur C. Clarke's novel of the same name. To say they were adapted with fidelity would be misleading, but at the same time, the first four issues preserve the narrative framework of both the book and the film, before the later issues gradually morph into comics more fitting of Kirby, Stanley and Marvel. Instead, then, it may be more justified to view them as transmedia texts that attempt to expand the fictional world of 2001 with unique narrative stories and characters. So I should just say at this point, Kirby initially illustrated and wrote a treasury edition. And when, when I say a treasury edition, it's kind of a, a Berliner size comic, and you'll see it outside uh, on the main wall, so it's bigger than the standard Marvel comic. Um, <clears throat> And that was released in January 1976, six, which then led to the Tempar series. My focus is not going to be on the Treasury Edition, which was essentially a direct ad adaptation of the film. Instead, I refer you to Drew Jeffrey's chapter in the Understanding Kubrick 2001 Space Odyssey edited collection, in which he offers an excellent textual analysis of this particular comic. Nor is it my aim to provide a comparative analysis of the comics, film and books, but firstly to provide some context as to their origins uh, and production, and secondly, to begin to situate the comics within what I see as a tradition of 2001 Space Odyssey's transmedia identity. So I think it's useful at this point to provide a brief outline of the industrial and historical context of the origins and productions of the comics. Jack Kirby, who had left Marvel Comics in 1970 to briefly join its rival DC Comics, was being cajoled into returning by the company's then editor-in-general, Archie Goodwin, along with Stan Lee. Kirby began illustrating comics in the 1930s, 
1940, he co-created the comic, comic character Captain America. In 1958, he joined Marvel Comics and began a collaboration uh, with the dialogue and writer and editor Stan Lee. The pair were responsible for creating a number of enduring comic book characters, including the Incredible Hulk, the Mighty Thor, the Fantastic Four, Iron Man, X-Men, Doctor Doom, and the Black Panther. Now, I'm sure all of these characters are familiar to in some way, given their dominance within the Marvel Cinematic Universe as a seemingly uh, permanent stranglehold on today's box office. So to that end, Kirby's influence can be seen not only to have impacted the comic book world, but ultimately the shape of Hollywood in the 21st century. So following his time at DC Comics, Kirby agreed to return to Marvel in 1975. But there was a condition. An adaptation of 2001 A Space Odyssey had to be his first project. Now it's unclear as to whether Kirby had himself initiated the idea, whether Marvel had insisted he take on the project. In his chapter about the comics, Drew Jeffries discusses how some accounts suggest Kirby was apparently less than thrilled to have been assigned the project, while other accounts contradict this, such as comic historian Sean Howe. Sean Howe, sorry, yes, Sean Howe, who implies that Kirby did negotiate what projects the world he would take on after returning to Marvel, including 2001 and a new original series, The Eternals. Either way, shortly after Kirby had signed a new contract with Marvel, Stan Lee and his regular soapbox column, so the soapbox column would be essentially kind of like a publicity announcement on the back of uh, each Marvel comic, he announced that, quote, Jack Kirby is back. One of Jolly Jack's first projects will be a Marvel Treasury edition of Hold Into Your Hats, 2001, A Space Odyssey. And so, in 1976, Marvel released a Treasury edition. Oops. Released Treasury edition billed as being, quote, an official adaptation of the MGM Stanley Kubrick production, in which the ultimate trip becomes the ultimate illustrated adventure. This issue was much closer to the film, film text in story and tone, with a faithful illustration that captured some of the visual qualities of Kubrick's work. But why did Marvel choose to adapt 2001? And why did MGM and Kubrick allow them to do so? So it was during the mid-1970s, under the direction of Archie Goodwin, and influenced greatly by Stan Lee, that Marvel began developing comic books based on Hollywood films, while Stan Lee himself was trying to develop films based on Marvel characters. At the same time, the industrial context in Hollywood was shifting towards high-concept, franchise-driven, transmedia right productions, such as Star Jaws and Star Wars. This is a bit of a glib industrial context. So simultaneously, the comic book industry was financially thriving and began to take advantage of these new transmedia opportunities. So, for example, Marvel's Archie Goodwin secured the rights to publish a six-part series based on the original 1977 Star Wars, as we can see here. Uh, and other films were similarly appropriated and expanded by Marvel, including Logan's Run, which was turned into a seven-issue series between January and July 1977. Uh, Planet of the Apes also ran for 29 issues between 1974 and 1977. Perhaps more bizarre was this adaptation of the most kind of classic of Hollywood odysseys, The Wizard of Oz, which was a, a collaboration between Marvel and DC Comics, and released in 1975, optimistically, it was kind of described as being the first issue they were never going to publish a sequel to this. So indeed, Marvel commenced a special series dedicated to the adaptation of the latest blockbuster releases. Titled the Marvel Super Special, the series ran for 41 issues between 1977 and 1986, producing weird and wonderful comics, such as adaptations of Spielberg's Close Encounters and Raiders of the Lost Ark, and adaptations of other big sci-fi franchises such as Star Trek. Those titles are perhaps not so bizarre, though, given their kind of science fiction and fantasy settings, lending themselves quite easily to adaptation in the Marvel style. Stranger were adaptations of James Bond films from the Roger Moore era, including For Your Eyes Only and Octopussy. Or an adaptation of Jaws 2, with Jaws itself leading Marvel to explore variations of the shark as monster in comics such as Ghost Rider. But no comics, not even the 2001 comics, can claim to be as weird as Marvel's foray into turning pop stars into comic book characters. So here we've got Kiss and the Beatles. Um, I should say, Kiss kind of, in their comic, battle Marvel's Doctor Doom. Yeah, it's a bizarre comic. So Marvel then were pursuing a policy of adapting popular and successful films, as well as these kind of weird and wonderful comics. And at the same time, 2001 was one of the most popular and commercially successful films around 
Ever since its release in 1968, 2001 had attracted large audiences, and the film was screened and reissued throughout the 1970s, often featuring in the, top, in the box office top 50 of trade journals such as Variety. And I know that I said at the start of this talk that I wouldn't talk about 2001's importance in cinematic history, but its industrial legacy, in terms of its impact on the box office and the popularisation of science fiction within Hollywood, cannot be underestimated. Marvel, perhaps sensing this success and mainstream popularity of the film, took a chance in adapting 2001 in comic book form. As for why Kubrick allowed this is much less clear. As I recently told someone at Wired magazine, quote, there are no traces of, Kub of the comic in the Kubrick archive. I don't think we will ever know if Kubrick saw them. Is that correct? Am I correct in that there's no kind of trace of the comic in the archive, just to put you on the spot there? No? Yeah. Well, I've never come across it, so I just found it bizarre. Um, so Kubrick's draft contract with MGM suggests, but not definitively, that Kubrick had, had no involvement in the MGM Marvel deal. Clause 27 of the draft contract states that, quote, neither you, Kubrick, nor we, MGM, shall, without the consent of the other party, have the right to, one, remake the photo play, two, produce a sequel to the photo play, or three, produce a radio or television program or television series based upon or related to the photo play. This clause then would seem to have prevented MGM from making an audiovisual sequel to 2001, and therefore the contract with Kubrick seemingly forced them to look to other transmedia adaptations of what had proven to be an extremely popular and successful film. Indeed, clause 2B of the contract stated that, quote, you Kubrick agree that we MGM shall have the right to publish in any medium or form and use the photo play, excerpts, dialogue, summaries, serializations and novelizations of the work, the screenplay or the photo play, including sequels and or continuations. Therefore, it would seem that MGM had the right to negotiate deals to adapt 2001 into other mediums without Kubrick's consent. And I should say, by the way, and this is the last thing I'm going to say about the, the matter of Kubrick's involvement, is that Kubrick's Polaris Productions, which was essentially kind of Kubrick's uh, publicity unit, um, and they were developing at the time one of the most kind of extensive merchandise, merchandising campaigns for 2001. They had been devising a potential children's comic book, but this idea fell through because Kubrick didn't want to make copies of the script available to the publisher. Um, Kubrick was certainly interested adap in adapting his films into visual novelizations and negotiated with Ballantine Books to publish his vision of a graphic novelization of Clockwork Orange in 1972. Writing to Ian Ballantyne, Kubrick explained his intention for the book, saying, quote, I think the idea of a total graphic record of the film, represented by each cut and the dialogue, will be an important innovation in film books. Therefore, it is not unreasonable to suggest that Kubrick would not have been adverse to the idea of the Marvel comic book adaptation. So at this point, I'm going to finally turn to the comics, okay? And there they are, all ten of them. As I say, you can get a real good look at them. Uh, they're on the kind of stairwell outside. Um, so each issue of the 2001 Space Odyssey comic was described as, quote, Stan Lee presents 2001 A Space Odyssey, based on concepts of the MGM movie by Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke. Now, I think it's this word, concepts, which is key to understanding the transmedia context of the comics and the larger A Space Odyssey fictional universe. Sorry, I'm just down in the beer. So I briefly want to explore what these concepts were, concepts that can be seen to form the basis of the first four issues of the series. So these four issues, the premiere issue, uh, Vira the She-Demon, Marek the Merciless, and Wheels of Death, took the basic narrative concept, the plot arc, plot arc, that informs both 2001, the film, and the book, but with variations in characters and locations. Now the basic plot arc in these four issues goes as something a little like this. The man-apes encounter the black monolith. The black monolith provokes the spark of the man-apes evolution. Several million years later, modern humans discover the black monolith again. Then the black monolith selects an individual, propels them through a stargate, and into a created environment. So the kind of 18th century film that we see in the book. And ultimately, the black monolith once more provokes the evolution of the human into a star child, or, as it's referred to in the comics, the new seed. So issue one was most faithful to the, Dominic, uh, sorry, to the dominant text, to Kubrick's film. The, the story sees what Kirby calls the Neo-Man, which was a substitute for the film's man-apes, become the beast killer after making contact with the black monolith and communicating with it. 
With his newfound intellect and aggression, the Beast Killer is able to dominate his environment and evolves into a space-faring human in a match cut that bridges the centuries and e echoes the jump cut in Kubrick's film. The human in this story, however, is stranded on an alien moon, his ship having crash landed. As he explores the planet, he encounters an alien being that wishes him, to, uh, wishes him dead. He attempts to escape from the alien, and in doing so, inexplicably comes into contact with a black monolith, which takes him into the Stargate and a sequence that Kirby draws to evoke the sequence in the film. Finally, as the human evolves in the confines of an idyllic environment, he eventually becomes the new seed. So this issue remains very close to the modes of evolution in both Clark's book and Kubrick's film. The Neo-Man is the man-ape and the new seed is the star child. And as the new seed floats off into the universe, Kirby leaves the reader with the following questions. What is its purpose? What is its destiny? The new seed answers the call of the beckoning cosmos, cosmos as the monolith waits for the maturing of the next to come. So issue two continues with the basic use of this plot arc. However, from a feminist perspective, and I use that term very loosely, but Kirby was kind of known for his uh, liberal leanings and support of kind of uh, causes such as feminism and gay rights in the 1970s. Uh, so introducing the character of Vira the She-Demon, the issue tells the story of a fiery female that makes a centrist trip from the caves to eternity. So Vira begins life as just that, plain old Vira, before her encounter with the monolith turns her into the She-Demon that is feared by the man-apes. By the 20th century, she has evolved into Vera, her evolution to modernity emphasised by a change of vowel in her name, before she too becomes a new seed, departing with a speed of light, quote, it knows its purpose and its destination, but above all, it knows it will live. So a feature of the comics was the regular monolith mail, a monthly letters column, and the fan letters submitted to the monolith, column, uh, monolith mail column reveal how audiences were consuming the com comics and indicates how some fans were reading the comics as, trans, as transmedia expansion of 2001, A Space Odyssey, the film. Indeed, the letters potentially allow us to revise our understanding of the 2001 film, to see it as but one of many texts that form a complex intertextual web of unique narrative experiences within the confines of its fictional universe, all of which provide multiple entry points to understand the expanded universe that is A Space Odyssey. So if we look at the letters submitted to Monolith Mail, in connection with issues one and two, we see that some of the fans were disgruntled. They felt that the potential to expand the 2001 universe was being wasted with a repetition of this basic plot arc. One fan raised this concern in a letter published in issue three, their concern being, quote, mostly questions about the future of the title. The story begins with an episode about the transition period of when man evolved from beast with the tutoring of the monolith. While of passing interest, will this be a continuing feature of the book? Will, be th will there be any, any continuing characters, any feature characters, any sort of continuing storyline, any end to 2001 when it temporally reaches 2002? And I think, by the way, that is an interesting question about what year it is in 2001. It's something that Peter's explored in his own book. So it may be that this fan was raising a number of key questions as, as to the transmedia identity and expansion of the Space Odyssey universe as well as evidencing what Henry Jenkins has called an encyclopedic, an encyclopedic impulse, wanting to understand the intricacies of the Space Odyssey universe. Some of the questions were answered in response by the Marvel editors, saying, quote, As to your questions about continuing characters and evolution, well, they were at least partly answered by this issue, issue three. No, fetal evolutions are not a requirement of every story, and yes, characters may well continue from one issue to the next. So when reading the comics, it gradually becomes clear that the storylines were beginning to expand the fictional universe of a space odyssey, and providing fans with new texts to comprehend its complex narrative operation. And there were indications of this within some of the fan mail to Marvel. New characters were being introduced, sustained by the basic evolutionary plot arc of the book and film. But new information was now to be added to this fictional universe that would begin to revise fan understanding of how a space odyssey, sorry, of how this space odyssey universe worked. So with this in mind, I want to begin thinking about how the fictional universe of A Space Odyssey can be seen in an expanded transmedia identity, that of the A Space Odyssey fictional universe. And when I'm talking about this idea of a fictional universe, I literally mean the kind of narrative operation, not the actual universe. 
So if we consider the definition of a transmedia story, according to Henry Jenkins, as being a story that unfolds across multiple media platforms, with each new text making a distinctive and valuable contribution to the whole, but which are simultaneously self-sustained and do not require the reader to be familiar with other interconnected texts, we can begin to see that some fans were approaching the 2001 comics in this fashion. Writing to the Monolith Mail uh, in issue 3, one fan said, quote, Issue 1 was the most fantastic comic I've read in a long while. And though I have neither read the book nor seen the movie, you made the saga easy to understand and fun to read. Now, this fan was not alone in their declaration of not being familiar with the dominant texts of the film and novel. Instead, such fans were entering the Space Odyssey, a fictional universe, through the comic book medium, with each issue being self-contained. And in turn, this pushed them toward viewing other texts within this expanded transmedia universe of a Space Odyssey. Another fan expressed similar sentiments, saying, quote, I read issue one not knowing a thing about the story. The next day I saw the movie, and for the first time, sorry, I saw the movie for the first time. Then I read the comic again and fully understood it, finally realising how great it was. You probably found that a bit odd that they found the uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, the film, only great after seeing the, uh, reading the comics. So if you consider how perplexing a movie 2001 Space Odyssey was upon its release, and still is perplexing 50 years on, we can begin to understand how it lends itself, intentional or not, intentional or not as a text ripe for med transmedia exploitation. With its post-classical breaking of formal narrative structures and frustratingly ambiguous storyline, particularly towards the end, it left open the possibility to expand the fictional universe and create new points of entry in new forms of media, such as the comic book. 2001's ambiguity meant that it left many questions unanswered, questions that other texts in other forms could begin to answer. And Marvel alluded to this when responding to a fan letter in issue 3's Monolith Mail. The fan argued that the comic book medium could not qu capture, quote, the majesty and beauty that made the movie a classic. In response, Marvel wrote, quote, it's not our intention to duplicate the majesty and the beauty of the movie. The aim of this co uh, comic book is to use a film as a springboard to all of the fantastic projections of future life and experience that there might be. So the complex fictional universe of a space odyssey and the ambiguities at the heart of the dominant film text allowed its scope to be expanded further and to contribute to audience understanding of it, what Henry Jenkins has referred to as additive comprehension. And so in issues three and four, a two-part story, uh, which is these two here, Marek the Merciless and Wheels of Death, we receive new information, learning that the monolith is not always successful in evolving humans into new seeds, and that some of the humans that it has brought into creative environments inhabit them in bliss forevermore, as is the case with uh, the character Marek the Merciless, who doesn't evolve into a new seed. In the same two issues, we also learn that there are multiple monoliths across the universe, probably created by some ancient civilization. In addition, the monolith has created multiple new seeds who in inhabit the universes. For the, these comics actually kind of hint that the uh, fictional universe of a space odyssey is a multiverse. And these new seeds omnisciently watch over human civilization throughout space and time in order to try and preserve life, as we see in issue seven. Titled The New Seed, issue seven promises, quote, at last, the most fantastic revolution of, uh, revelation of them all. And the comic book asks, asks whether the new seed was spawned by the monolith and whether it was a saviour or destroyer. So the story of this particular issue focuses on the everyday life of the star child, the new seed, revealing it to be a protector of life, literally jetting around the cosmos, battling to save various civilizations from destroying themselves. It's an example of how the comics eventually broke the basic plot arc to explore the characters and narrative devices of this space odyssey fictional universe in more detail. The comics also began to move beyond the temporal restrictions of the dominant, the dominant film text and the original book. So in issue 5, Norton's of, Norton of New York, the story takes place in a dystopian New York City in the year 2040, where the Smithsonian Museum in Washington DC displays a replica of the black monolith, an object that has fascinated scientific minds since its discovery on Earth's moon in the film 2001 Space Odyssey. Rather than this being a story of the evolution of a primitive humanoid, instead it tells the story of Norton's att attempts to escape the dystopian Earth, aided by the monolith, which allows him to travel through the, star the cosmos via the use of stargates. So what becomes evident from these later comics uh, in the series, 
and this in turn can be related to the sequel novels by Arthur C. Clarke, is that the transmedia fictional universe of A Space Odyssey moved beyond the characters and locations of Kubrick's films and instead utilised the key ambiguous components that allowed the expansion of its narrative potential. At the centre of this transmedia expansion are the monoliths and the new seeds, which act as the controlling fate behind everything that happens in the universe. We never fully piece together all of the information about the monolith or the new seeds in any single text, film, novel or comic, but can instead access each text on its own and understand how the monolith and new seed, stroke, star child, operate in this fictional universe. Indeed, the monolith and new seeds are able to impact upon the timeline of this narrative universe as well as serve as catalysts for the introduction of new characters. So these are the last three issues of uh, the Marvel comic series. The capture of X-51, Mr. Machine and Hotline to Hades. Uh, and these three issues broke drastically with the previous issues, with the story focusing on the character of Mr. Machine and his endeavours to escape the US Army and to prove his humanity. Indeed, as issue 9 suggests, quote, Mr. Mag Machine battles overwhelming evil for the one thing he may not possess, a soul. So the story of Mr. Machine's evolution, brought apart in, uh, about in part by the monolith, spans these final three issues. And the character was one of a number of advanced robots that had been adapted by the US Army, but all of whom went psychotic, as they were not allowed to develop human traits, and his storyline is uh, strikingly familiar in tone to that of Hal. So this dramatic change to focus on an evolving superhero character may largely be as a result of a dramatic decline in sales of the comic. Um, as Gary Westphal suggests, the overwhelming majority of successful comic books have featured superheroes, and so 2001 A Space Odyssey shifted its focus to the action-packed adventures of a superhero. And as you can see by the front covers, this is not really anything to do with 2001 A Space Odyssey, kind of Kubrick's film anymore. This is very much a Marvel kind of story. What is interesting, however, is the further expansion of our understanding of the monoliths and their intentions. The monoliths in these final three issues seem less concerned with the evolution of humans, who they seemingly have realised are self-destructive warmongers, and instead the monoliths focus on the evolution of uh, robots and artificial intelligence. They are determined to protect Mr. Machine and to ensure his survival in order to foster a form of machine intelligence as a promising new direction for the advancement of life and civilization. Sadly, the narrative potential uh, sorry, the nar potential narrative intrigue gives way to mainly superhero action. And these final issues are more concerned about appealing to a more typical superhero-minded comic book reader, ra rather than a reader wanting to further engage with the ways the Space Odyssey universe functioned. When the 2001 comic series came to an end, when Kirby and Stan Lee finally realised that the um, series had run its course, Machine uh, Man was spun off into his own series, penned also by uh, Kirby and debuting in 1978, and this was to be the continuing legacy of the Space Odyssey universe. The 2001 comics themselves drifted into obscurity, and over the years have proven more of an intrigue to Kubrick cultists like myself, and to enthusiastic collectors of Jack Kirby, rather than Marvel fans. Indeed, in May 2018, the Kirby Museum in New York held a pop-up exhibition, in part fueled by the fact that the comic is one of the few Kirby works that hasn't been reprinted. However, I do believe that uh, we're getting closer to the comics finally being uh, reprinted in, in the near future. So Kirby introduced the 2001 comics by saying that the monoliths, awesome secrets, want, would be revealed. And it's precisely those words, awesome secrets, where we can begin best to understand how the Marvel comics expand the narrative universe of 2001 A Space Odyssey. The ambiguity at the heart of 2001, the lack of any clear meaning or interpretation, means that when audiences watch the films, there is always an attempt to decipher what it means. What is the monolith? What is the Star Child? What is the Stargate sequence about? And this goes back to my original point about my desire to find out ever more information about how this fictional universe operates and to expand my interaction with its narrative. Indeed, 2001 can be said to possess a transmedia identity with no single text fully revealing how the fictional universe works, instead only providing pieces of information. And this complex fictional universe is able to sustain multiple characters and stories. It's not about any single character, but rather about how, how the characters and their stories unfold within the context of the Space Odyssey universe. Audiences of 2001 were originally pushed towards extra textual objects such as Clark's book, but even more texts have since appeared, including an official sequel, sorry, an unofficial sequel to the film, 2010, subsequently adapted into a two-part limited series by Marvel. In addition, the story of the eventual film was a coalescence uh, of ideas, including the heart from hard science from Kubrick and Clark's 
own imagination from works about evolution, and of course, from a number of Clark Shaw stories, most notably Encounter in the Dawn and The Sentinel. So the Marvel comics can be argued as being part of a long line of transmedia narratives that can be labelled under the Space Odyssey expanded universe. So to end, the 2001 comics, just like the film, the book, the soundtrack, the text that inspired Clark and Kubrick, and the subsequent works by Clark, all provide fans with additive comprehension, but no definitive clarity. 2001 A Space Odyssey, the film, remains the dominant text due to its cultural status and that of its director, Stanley Kubrick, but there are now numerous other works that provide new points of entry. Kubrick had authorial control of this text, and to various extent, uh, the book by Clark, but the Space Odyssey universe uh, has expanded beyond him, beyond Clark, to become a phenomen phenomenon owned by the fans that relate to it. So, to kind of conclude, I myself find that the Space Odyssey fictional universe and the multiple entry points and narrative routes available, including the Marvel comics, utterly enthralling. And the enigmas of 2001 A Space Odyssey, the film that made this possible, are why it is a vast universe of narrative potential to explore, and that is why I will always keep returning to it. And it's probably why I don't really find it boring. Thank you. <laughs> and also, I have to say thank you for Yeah, thank you, uh, James, for this wonderful birthday contribution to our symposium weekend. Um, I'm glad you like the German beer. <laughs> uh, well, maybe to open with a question that's obvious, but uh, just to, to pinpoint it down again. Um, so you found the, the Marvel comics less boring than Kubrick's oh. and Clark's film? Oh, crikey. Um, the comic books are terrible. Um, but it just it provides a new way. Somebody because I've seen the film so many times. It's just this idea of I want to know more about the universe, and they the comics kind of provide an opportunity um, to provide some kind of indication of how the universe works. And it's something that we're discussing upstairs. Like Peter was saying, what was happening on Earth during these like the two thousand one film. It's just those kind of questions that intrigue me. Yeah, the comic books are one way to kind of find that out. What I also had in mind was uh, there was one study that called it one of the weirdest comics ever mm, made. Yeah, I I don't agree with that because the kiss. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you've shown us other weird examples. I'm sure there are some comments in the audience, questions, remarks. Yes, please just give me a second because we're recording this again for the YouTube channel, so the mic comes to you and just uh, wait a moment. Um, until the mic arrives. So, thank you very much for this inspiring talk. Uh, I was interested in the aspect, do you know how Stan Lee uh, was involved in all of this? Because uh, doing some research on Marvel Comics, I came across the very strange um, incidents that uh, Stan Lee was closely uh, connected with Alain René, the a French avant-garde director, and they wrote uh, three screenplays in the 70s together that never got filmed. So I was wondering if there was maybe any connection with uh, Stan Lee and uh, the whole idea of uh, adapting Kubrick. I'll be honest, I don't know. Um, this is something I'd like to know more. I mean, I've tried to kind of dig into how Kubrick and Stan Lee, with what the connection is there. Drew Jeffries is also looking into it. I, I just honestly don't know what the how it came about. It's very unclear, and I, that, yeah, that is kind of a potential uh, route to investigate. So maybe if uh, there is no material in the Kubrick archives, maybe something can be found out in the Marvel archives. I've tried this. contacting Marvel, but they're very suspicious. Ah, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I also clocked the Marvel T-shirt there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I'd like, to, of course, uh, compliments for your presentation. Um, just a minor contribution that comes from the uh, Arthur C. Clarke Archive in Washington, which I visited last year. Um, you wondered, uh, rightly, um, if whether Kubrick was aware or not uh, of, <laughs> of the whole thing. and. I drew in his chapter that you mentioned very rightly 
points uh, toward the, the that part of the uh, contract that uh, seemingly allowed MGM to license the thing. Um, in uh, the uh, Clark Arcade, there's a letter uh, from Clark to a friend that comments um, this um, Marvel Enterprise and Clark which, by the way, was uh, for the audience who doesn't know that, was in contact with uh, Kubrick for, uh, had been in contact with Kubrick for many years uh, after 2001, and suggests to this guy Kubrick was not, um, was aware of that, didn't like it at all, and um, uh, Clark says, <laughs> and I'm just quoting, uh, Clark says, uh, mentioned to me that uh, he, he would have loved to sue them. But that's just Clark saying this to a friend. Whether it was real or not, I'm not in position to say <laughs> to say this. Uh, yeah. Clark tended to, to just say um, verbatim what uh, Kubrick said and vice versa. So um, I, I, I trust I trust Clark um, basically um, in terms of what I've found out in the archive. It yeah. doesn't it doesn't plainly um, tell lies. So uh, there's a strong suggestion that Kubrick was a was aware because um, otherwise Clark wouldn't say that. And B was not very happy about that um, whether or not the the contract yeah. that we mentioned was uh, allowed uh, MGM to do that or not um, it's up to us See, to it's speculate. interesting this point because I did show the comics to Jan Harlan a few years back and he'd never seen them in fact he got me to scan the comics and send them over to him uh, but that's because he, he kind of hoards stuff um, whether Jan was kind of just I don't know pretending I don't know other questions, remarks, comments? Yeah, Peter. Peter, this is not my PhD viva. <laughs> uh, no, thanks a lot. Uh, I mean, maybe you can t tell a little bit more about the, the fan letters, because it seems to me that uh, the analysis of the uh, storylines of, of the, the, the comic books is very interesting. But I'm not 100% sure, from your own experience, I, I understand why you find it to be a good way into the narrative universe. But from my own experience, you know, the novel was enough, you know. And then, of course, there were all these sequel novels. And then I don't know whether you've come across the Orthoquel novel, the Orthoquel novels that Stephen Baxter wrote together with uh, Arthur C. Clarke called The Time Odyssey which is supposed to be based on similar concepts, but not placed necessarily in the same universe. So in a sense, there's all this information uh, in the novel and the sequels that allow you to inhabit the universe more fully. Now, your and my experiences are different, but can you say a little bit more about what might be representative of the, the other fans writing in, you know, both in their connection to the film, but also, as you interestingly pointed out, this might be their first engagement yeah. with the story, with the, the 2001 universe in the first place. Can you say a little bit more about that? I think really, I mean, it, we have to be careful because obviously these people that are writing into the monolith mail are obviously comic book fans firstly and therefore potentially a different audience. Um, and therefore their experiences, yeah, would be probably very different. They probably want to enter this kind of universe through this kind of superhero narrative. Um, I just, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's interesting that some of them found it, the, the comics explained the films for them, um, sorry, the, the film for them, because they didn't particularly understand the film, or it's the first time that they engaged with it. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't actually remember what the other fan letters were about, so it's something that I'd have to go back to the comics and look at. Uh, but yeah, I think for me, it is kind of an interesting um, way to analyse these comics, is through the fans, and I would potentially kind of want to expand the research there, definitely. Could you maybe again show us a slide with all the comic oh, covers? Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, or maybe just just one cover. Can you see it? So I'm just reading one. Um, do you know what? I'm just going to stick to my original answer because I can't actually read them. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, I'll come back to you, Peter. <laughs> Maybe you can show us a slide again with the covers of the... Oh, the covers of the comics, the sorry, yeah. Because what I also found um, striking was that there's a kind of a double illusion with uh, 
you have of course this this typical Marvel Comics group uh, headline. Yeah. And then um, uh, underlined, uh, you find the uh, begin a new journey to the stars and beyond, uh, which is which could be read as a double allusion to yeah. uh, uh, Jupiter and Beyond the Infinite, and of course the working title uh, Journey Beyond the Stars. Would you like to comment on that? Um, you put me on the spot again, and if I've had a beer, <laughs> so. Um. <laughs> and and, and also, w- which is quite uh, interesting, is that they they always uh, reduce it in a, in a kind of an iconic way to the monolith. You have the monolith, the ape mask, and the astronaut helmet yeah, on every definitely. every cover. Yeah, I think that's probably just Kirby kind of trying to. Mm-hmm. It was clear because Kirby did really kind of love the film, um, and therefore that's probably just kind of just yeah ode to the film basically. Um, I'll be honest, I wouldn't read too much into that, as Peter says, into the story of these comics, because they are a bit stupid. Um, but they're, they're intriguing, definitely. Uh, I'd highly recommend having a good look at them on the stairwell, um, if you're into that kind of thing. And I guess you've already mentioned that uh, in the eighth issue, the um, uh, Mr. Machine Mr. character Machine, yeah, is yeah. introduced. And I or guess Machine Man. A Machine yeah. Man, and, and then Kirby continues with a whole new series featuring yeah. that Machine Man character. It didn't do very well, because mm. um, it just wasn't a popular character. Whether it's to do with the fact that it's associated with, with this comic series, I don't know, but that also didn't really kind of get anywhere. Are there more questions or comments? Yes. Thank you for this non-boring lecture. (laughs) (laughs) But I would like to comment on the video clip you showed uh, in the beginning. Because there's one aspect uh, that I would like to highlight or I I find rather interesting. He was talking about the uh, operating system of the IBM PC, DOS 2.0. And he was talking about this legendary book from Peter Norton inside the IBM PC, which is basically about assembler programming and stuff like that so this shows how deeply interested he was uh, stanley kubrick was in everything technical everything he could touch on even though it would not really make sense for him to learn assembler programming or uh, the inner workings of an ibm pc operating system Uh, but it really documents or shows how much he looked into everything very much detailed and i will come to Filippo later on because i got uh, his book about uh, 30, 30 years with mm-hmm. stanley and uh, that's where i learned about his yeah he was kind of maniac with the technology and and uh, it as well in the very beginning yeah. that was very striking uh, to see in this clip Sorry, it was not part of your uh, oh, no, but, I mean, I lecture. I completely agree in, with it. It reflects that. It's special, but I yeah. really would like to highlight that. It reflects, I mean, it wasn't just technology. It was any kind of topic that he would obsessively learn everything about until he was the expert and the other person who was meant to be the expert is no longer the expert. Um, and I think James B. Harris said because it, it terrified him. And he was the one, he, he, I did an interview with James B. Harris, Kubrick's um, business partner back in the 1950s who said that he doesn't like to use the term genius very often, but he applied it to Kubrick because of this kind of systematic way that he would just get into an issue and figure it out and become an expert, yeah. And you see that in the clip, as you say, definitely. Having read your forthcoming book in an (laughs) earlier version, there is a darker side to this. Because basically, he doesn't give us movies. He wastes his time learning about everything in the universe. Can you say a little bit more? Because in your book, of course, you will offer the beginnings of an explanation of how this happens. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I think this, the kind of way that I approach Kubrick is because this kind of obsessive nature, at times, particularly in his later career, when he, he kind of got this freedom to explore issues, it led to kind of a crippling ability to actually get anything into production he would so obsessively kind of research stuff until he found out every possible kind of option you see this in eyes wide shut for instance he sends out people to document the entire streets of london until he knows like what every shop looks like and um yeah it it becomes a bit of a, a debilitating kind of condition in the end is that the kind of thing you want me to get out there peter is 
Yeah. Um, and because, yeah, in the 1980s, when you see that clip, for instance, he's working on AI. He'd been potentially exploring producing AI for some years by then. Um, and he can never really get anything out of production. Indeed, uh, Brian Aldiss kind of said that he thought Kubrick had reached the peak of his artistic powers by the 1980s and that he was in permanent decline and had lost kind of his abilities to produce and create simply because of that obsessive nature. Yeah. Sorry to be a bit bleak there. Any other questions, comments, remarks? Yes. Uh, first of all, Mr. Cartwright did look like that um, from <laughs> the wall. Um, and second of all, you, you alluded to the Star Trek comics from Marvel and the Star Wars comics from Marvel as well. And over time, those have been decided that they're not canon. These are things that have been done by fans and that they're separate to the main universe. I mean, is there a case here that had Kubrick lived longer and more films been made in this universe, these would have been just non-canon and gone rid of? So the comics would be non-canon? And just sort of like, there, there's something that some fans have done. It's not part of the main narrative we want to produce, which is what, what has happened with the Star Wars comics, for instance, that Marvel and Dark Horse and others have produced. When the universe was restarted a few years ago, they said everything we produced is not canon anymore. I've forgotten about. I, the Star Trek comics from Marvel, DC, and even further back with Gold Key comics are not canon and just forgotten about. It's not the main story that the producers want to make. Yeah, I mean, this is nothing to do with Kubrick, so... Um yeah, they're not canon, if you will. Um, it's just a very intriguing way to perhaps potentially think about other narrative ways to enter the universe with the fans that were interacting with them. Um, the comics were technically canonised by Marvel, by the continuation of the comics through Mr. Machine. So technically they are part of that Marvel um, comic book universe. But beyond that, completely separate to anything that Kubrick did, yeah. Well, thank you again so much for this stimulating uh, contribution. And I think now we have time for a little presentation and discussion of your book, which just came out, Understanding Kubrick's 2001. Um, and I would also like to join us here uh, on the panel, uh, the contributors, Filippo Olivieri, Simone Odino and Vincent Jonas. But thank you first again to James Fenwick. This isn't a marketing sale, but it's not like a QVC promotion or anything, but we are just going to talk about the book for a bit. So yeah, I apologize. You're going to have to listen to me for a bit longer. <laughs> um, so and if I may just uh, interrupt, if you have any questions, comments, just join in and uh, raise yeah. your hand. I just quickly before kind of opening it up, I wanted to talk about the book and the kind of origins uh, of the book. So back in May 2016, we had a, a three day Kubrick conference that we held at Leicester. All you guys attended, Peter was there. We had a whole host of kind of Kubrick scholars. And there was a lot of drinking done and a lot of discussing done about Kubrick and the kind of potential future research. And we decided that, you know, there's not been enough written about 2001, a space odyssey. Why don't we do an edited collection? Um, and so here it is, Understanding Kubrick's 2001, a space odyssey, published in June, 2018. Uh, the kind of intention for the book was to bring together uh, new perspectives. It's a phrase you'll hear again and again in Kubrick uh, kind of s scholarship. Um, my intention was this thinking of, you know, you've got the kind of traditional uh, Kubrick scholarship that's very much textual analysis based. It's just reading the films and trying to interpret them. There's a much more kind of newer scholarship that takes advantage of the Kubrick archive and is very much more empirical focused using um, production documents, etc., interviews. And so we kind of, this collection explores these various methodologies. Um, and I think it's actually with this panel, I should also say the book has got female contributors. It's not all white <laughs> middle-class men. <laughs> um, but yeah, we are represented here by these kind of various methodologies. I don't think it's unfair to say that Vincent and Niles, you're kind of both from this 
much more of a theoretical and philosophical perspective, Filippo and Simone, much more from this kind of archival-based perspective. And so that was the kind of intention with the book. Um, as I briefly put here from the extract from the introduction, these chapters offer new and interpretive approaches, or at least that's the intention, uh, that examine aesthetics, performance, technological design, philosophical discourse, genre, authorial agency, uh, and each chapter is linked by the exploration of Kubrick's intellectual concerns as an auteur and the historicism and aesthetic representation of 2001, with the ultimate aim of bringing together a range of new scholarly perspectives from the full range of Kubrick's studies. And so, yeah, we've got a, a variety of uh, contributors to the collection. Um, to highlight, as I said, Drew Jeffries, who's written about the uh, the um, trans uh, sorry the um, Treasury Edition Marvel comic. One of my particular favourites is Katerina Martino, who used to work at the Kubrick Archive, I believe, or she said she did. Um, and she, <laughs> she wrote originally a piece about kind of photographs in the archive, and she's developed it into this um, expanded article about the negative pot positive metaphors of photography in 2001, and got this excellent kind of analysis of how 2001 A Space Odyssey is Kubrick's philosophy of photography, and based on his kind of own experiences as a photographer. Um, but yeah, so I don't want to talk for too long. We've got four of the contributors here. Um, I've highlighted in white their particular chapters. We've got Simone that explores kind of the origins of 2001 and kind of explores how Kubrick in the aftermath of Dr. Strangelove is looking at some sort of new way of developing a, um, a new story based on kind of nuclear weapons, ex extraterrestrial life, etc. Um, Vincent, your kind of chapters about actors and this kind of like... Um, the kind of robotic, I don't want to get into the debate again, but um, the kind of distance in the performance of acting. Neil's yours is about kind of um, the image of the astronaut, yeah, the legacy of the astronaut in films such as um, Toy Story um, and various other kind of aspects. And then, Filippo, you've offered this, as we say, that a comprehensive chronology of the film and kind of explore the fact, which I find this fascinating, that we often think of Kubrick as the absolute kind of authorial agent of 2001 A Space Odyssey and neglect to understand the hundreds and hundreds of other people that worked on this film. And I think your chapter really gets at that, this idea that there's so many other people that contribute to the overall vision of the film. So yeah, I've had enough of talking. <laughs> um, shall I hand it over firstly to Vincent and this idea, um, what was the question I got for you? Oh yeah, the idea then, that because you're a scholar that's based in France. And for instance, somebody like Nathan Abrams, who's a, a kind of a big cheese within Kubrick scholarship, he believes that Kubrick scholars have to visit the Kubrick archive, otherwise they can't write about, <laughs> about, the Kub about Kubrick. For someone that is based on the continent, I mean, what are your views there? Do you think that the Kubrick archive is kind of the, the holy grail that should be visited, or are there other ways to explore Kubrick and understand Kubrick that don't need to utilise the archive? I think we shouldn't be as uh, authoritarian as Nathan here. Um, yeah, there's definitely been a split in the last 10 years or so between French publications and English publications because most French uh, scholars don't ever go to visit the archives at all, and it doesn't mean that all their books are just to be wasted away, I hope. Uh, I think that at the very beginning, um, archival researchers such as Nathan and Peter Kramer was very good at it too, tended to uh, criticize all the dead ends of previous interpretations and just show how uh, with factual elements they were proven wrong and I think that was very necessary obviously thanks to the archives. Uh, now I think that it would also be time for researchers to just use uh, the products uh, taken out from the archives by uh, Peter, Nathan and Simone and everything just to uh, stimulate new interpretations and I think that uh, if more and more books uh, like the Taschen book for instance which has been translated into French get translated then it could also enable a new kind of interpretation that would take into account uh, the archival research but I don't think that it makes interpretation obsolete. I hope not. <laughs> so it's a happy balance that needs to be achieved. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You say the same, Alice, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, um, most of the 
the items of our exhibition uh, are of course taken from the from the archives and it's a very uh, fruitful source so to speak and it's a wonderful opportunity because I think it's it's uh, very rare for a director of uh, such a name um, that it's been can be found in an open archive since 2007 so um, already for more than 10 years now and uh, it's kind of funny because when when I went there to the archive uh, of course I've met Filippo of course I've met Peter so it's um, a bunch of people who are very um, into the archive considering the materials and uh, delving deeper and deeper and um, always find new aspects and only on 2001 there's still so much to be found I guess because from all the films uh, it's um, most material is on 2001 so um, I think still it can be a, a very fruitful source for, for future generations or interpretations to come. Yeah, I should perhaps just point out, I know that Richard Daniels has done a talk here about the Kubrick archive, but it, it is, when you go there, you don't kind of realise how vast it is. And the amount of times I've seen people go there that kind of think that they'll find the source of Kubrick's inspiration, and then they're faced with pages and pages of production documents that don't reveal much in the way of inspiration, do they? So. Yeah, it can be a bit of a, a challenge. Um, so in your talk, Vincent, kind of discussing this idea um, of transhumanism, etc., I just quickly wanted to get your your views about what ultimately you think that Kubrick was trying to achieve with 2001, and ultimately what his message was. <laughs> uh, put you on the spot. Yeah, 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 sure. I wouldn't presume to just reveal <laughs> a message that everybody's been looking for in the last 50 years, obviously. Um, I think that what I'm trying to uh, go towards is uh, the overall idea would be humility. I think that Kubrick's really about, which is paradoxical given uh, Kubrick's own uh, image and persona of the great uh, genius capable to do everything, but I think it's really a, a message of humility in 2001. Uh, I think it's Jan Harlan, I think, who uh, called uh, 2001 a big bow to the unknown. And well, I think that's uh, absolutely true, which uh, in a way is also about uh, putting humanity, well, we discussed it a bit earlier this afternoon as well, putting humanity in its rightful place, decentering in a way uh, our perspective on the universe, uh, which of course is paradoxical because it takes a, a very self-confident director to have such an incredible interpretive scope in a film. But yeah, I think that's what he was uh, driving at. And uh, you mentioned earlier on his obsessive behavior, how it was crippling him. And I think that he was very self-conscious about his own uh, obsessive need to control everything because I think it reflects in the, in the films themselves. They're the films of a great uh, dictatorial genius, if we want, well, at least if we believe his image, because it's just an image, as uh, yeah. Filippo uh, pointed out. And yet in the film, all the control structures always fail, and it's always about how there's more than the human perspective on the universe and so on. So, yeah, I would, I would say it's something rather in that direction than, obviously, uh, the whole point was... Uh, for Kubrick to uh, purposefully leave the films open to multiple interpretations. So well, that's just my uh, vision oh. of it anyway. Um, so Mone, just to bring you in on that then, because your chapter kind of tries to get at the kind of source of Kubrick's motivations for the films. So would you kind of agree there? I mean, what do you think he was trying to do? I, ag I agree with Vincent saying that, of course, um, we are we are not in position to, to say to a certain uh, uh, for a fact what he wanted or not, but uh, there is sufficient uh, evidence in the archives, both uh, Kubrick and Clark's, uh, to point to point us in in a, in a direction, at least in the in the process of how the movie evolved in answering these questions. Um, that's one of the ways we can approach the question in a successful way. I think we can probably say what he wanted because I don't want to sound. Um, 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 inappropriate, but prob I don't know if he knew what he wanted. He, he, he kept asking uh, his question. It, definitely, his, Kubrick started with this idea of 
I want to show uh, the effects of the um, so-called first um, first contact with uh, mankind and uh, um, extraterrestrials. And that was his uh, very first uh, idea, and he kept saying that uh, with friends, and he kept um, kept making this comparison with friends. Uh, he wanted to show this image of a tall being uh, very much uh, looking like uh, Giacometti. Uh, sculpture uh, taking the astronaut by the hand and leading him into this bright future uh, which is something we don't actually see of course in the final movie uh, we could just um, ask ourselves this question and um, wonder why he didn't actually end up with this which by the way stayed in the script for at least uh, 18 months um, roughly uh, so why did he change his mind what what drove him to, to change his mind. Uh, um, uh, all, all, all these questions are probably more interesting, at least to me, um, to explore instead of um, d dragging um, a, a, an ultimate meaning from the text itself, which of course it's an inter interesting question in itself. Okay, Philip, I just want to draw you into this particular question because the book's called Understanding Kubrick's 2001 Space Odyssey. Your chapter, I'm not saying that you're saying that Kubrick didn't create this film, but your chapter brings to kind of emphasizes the collaboration uh, of all these kind of colleagues. Therefore, to what extent would you kind of say that um, this was purely Kubrick's vision? And what kind of, what help did he get in creating this vision? Okay, so, um, well, actually, I, I created a, this chronology by compiling uh, a list of events that I found uh, um, in uh, the Kubrick's collaborators' memoirs, like Clark the, being the primary source for the uh, structure, structuring of the screenplay, and then all the other interviews uh, with the technical uh, people, the technical department, and uh, the special effects people. So uh, the common image is that Kubrick was the sole originator of the work of art, which is also a concept, uh, like uh, James said before, if, if he was an auteur or if he should be considered an, as an auteur, which is a, a fasci fascinating concept because, of course, it taps into the romantic view of the artist that can create a work of art that then transcends the artist himself and Kubrick, as any other film director, and possibly even more, wanted to be, to be perceived as such, the, the all-controlling auteur. But if we, want, if we go and see all the other reports, we see that other people, of course, contributed to the making of, the, uh, of his films, and cinema is a very collaborative medium. Uh, instead of saying writing or even music, a, a composer can write a symphony just by himself and uh, it's not easy to say if he was an auteur or if it's not an auteur or if he, he is not to be considered an auteur and his films are more a product of a more collaborative agency a, a autorial agency i would say my personal view at least i would say that uh, these films kubrick's films are definitely the product of his uh, imagination, because uh, he initiated the films, especially after uh, Dr. Strangelove, he selected a topic, he selected a piece of property, a book, a novel, and then followed through every single step of the production up until marketing and distribution. So even if he didn't do everything by himself, he certainly took all the decisions. So his films are the result of his decisions and in a way they are the result of his taste and in fact there's a nice quote by Kubrick uh, we, who said in an interview that the director should be the arbiter of the aesthetic taste or even a taste machine so his films are the result of his taste and if this qualifies him as an auteur I can't say but he certainly took all the decisions uh, for his films Count, countless numbers of yeah, countless decisions. numbers of decisions. In 2001, especially. Yeah, it's that kind of thing where he would get all the decisions that he could kind of have available to himself, and then he'd take the decision of which one was the best. Exactly. Case, yeah. So the, the auteur, in this case, st stands not in having all the ideas, but to selecting the ideas that he yeah. has. I don't want to dominate the discussion, so should we open it up? 
to anybody that's got any questions about anything. Yeah, any questions, any comments so far? You too. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course. Right, let's <laughs> process. We can talk about the cake, uh, which <laughs> looms enticingly here enticingly. in front of us. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, I mean, this, these are some very important questions. I mean, I, I think uh, if, if I could, if I had any say in it, we would never use the term auteur anymore. Uh, because people have crazy ideas of what that term means and they shift so much in different contexts and historically so much. Um, but I, I like the summary. Uh, you don't have to come up with every single idea. You don't have to carry out every single idea, but someone has to make the decision which one to carry out. Uh, and, and it seems to me that, that that's probably what's happening on the Kubrick film. Um, and uh, the, the, the comparison with other media is actually quite tricky. Because it's not the case that a novelist just writes a novel. There's an editor, <laughs> there's an agent, and boy, have have original manuscript been rewritten in the process of interacting with agents and editors. Uh, so we should not underplay how collaborative other art forms are. But but I think with your summary of of how we might understand Kubrick, and I only want to add Katrina McAvoy's concept of of production as exploration. So it's not at all that Kubrick in advance knows what he wants. Not at the all. process is about getting the options as the said, and getting as many options as possible. And of course that uh, actually, I would go with, with James Fenwick on this, uh, that at some point that becomes crippling. Yep. When in the process, before you even commit to a project, you want to have all the options available, that prevents you from ever doing anything ever again. Uh, so we're actually lucky that we had any films at all from the 80s onwards. Um, but I, I just want to make one more point about I interpretation and, and archival research. I think the objectives of the two things are very different. I don't think with my research I ever try to disprove an interpretation because an interpretation almost by definition is not disprovable, it's not falsifiable. In that sense it's not in Popper's terms science or, or, or scholarship, it's something else. It's important, but it's something else altogether. So I don't think you can disprove an interpretation uh, with archival research. What you can do is, interpretations tend to make factual claims about the world. Uh, for example, 2001 was not successful at the box office and critics rejected it. Now that's got nothing to do with interpretation, but it's often included in an essay that interprets the film. So these are factual claims, and I think those factual claims we have to check. But the interpretation itself cannot be disproven. So I think we, we should keep that in mind. Uh, and the other thing worth saying is, very finally, uh, it wasn't just the Kubik archive that allowed us to, to answer those factual questions. I did my res a lot of my research on 2001 before the Kubik archive was opened. I misinterpreted what I found, <laughs> but and I never published it, luckily, uh, but it was there. And now we know from all the exciting research that Nathan, Simone, and Filippo and others have done, there were plenty of other archives that were available all along where we could have found uh, quest, uh, quest answers to factual questions. It's just that no one bothered because the film seemed to be so rich for interpretations. Why bother doing anything else? Uh, so it was all available to, to begin to do other kinds of work, but it didn't seem to be necessary. And I think we're now in an interesting situation where there is a certain group of people wh who think that, yes, we interpret films, but we also want to find out more about the empirical uh, circumstances of production, marketing, and reception. And there's others who continue with doing uh, traditional forms of interpretation, which don't need this. Uh, but I just want to avoid thinking that it's the opening of the archive that made it possible. It was possible all along. Uh, it's now easier to do, <laughs> certainly. And there's more of a community that has emerged from people going to the archive. But it was always possible. If I may just uh, say a word. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, I completely agree, of course, with you that uh, it's not the interpretation that can be disproved. Uh, but I think that many uh, scholars tended to base uh, their interpretations on facts that you actually disproved, which, of course, makes it all the more interesting for uh, well, archival research and uh, all the factual research that all of you did. And I'm thinking in 2001 about uh, the legend according to which the film was a failure with the general public, for instance, which you uh, very uh, rightly uh, disproved, which I think tended to uh, 
put a biased interpretation, uh, maybe especially in France, towards thinking that the film is a highly pessimistic view, and we discussed it earlier, uh, of humanity, and that as a consequence, it pleases the kind of uh, refined uh, taste of the scholar who enjoys uh, criticizing humanity and everything. And so I think that uh, the discovery, or at least the rediscovery that the film pleased everybody can also be the basis to uh, interpreting the film in a more optimistic way, which is what we tried to do uh, earlier on. So I think in this regard, it can really help interpretation just to move forward. If I just can use a quote that I um, tend to use very often when archives are concerned, um, the archive is a map, and the map is not the territory. Um, so, yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> it's not mine, unfortunately. Um, which means that even with this incredible wealth of materials, we, we could spend our whole lifetimes studying and still not um, um, uh, exhausting the, the options. Um, uh, this thing, thing of the community that you mentioned, it's very important because um, just in terms of the secondary works that have been produced uh, on the archive in the last 10 years, uh, it's getting very hard to um, um, focus on something and produce something um, significant. Just talking about 2001 alone, it's getting very, very difficult. So uh, if there is one thing that I would like to suggest the audience, first of all, is to go to, to visit this uh, place, which is, by the way, run by very nice people, uh, which happen to be the audience, but I would have said that anyway, uh, because I believe I believe in it. Um, and third, second, to realize how it seems to be easy to, 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 to drag, uh, to, to get meaning from... Uh, um, uh, a simple letter or something, but if you are not um, in position to link it with something that somebody else has, has written or maybe just thought and communicated to you, um, it's, it gets just to a um, fan-based thing, the thrill to be there and hold this uh, fantastic screenplay uh, that could be corrected. Uh, it's nice the first time the second time kind of get pointless and so the this uh, web uh, that uh, the archives as a hub uh, literally has been able to create is probably one of the most uh, interesting thing that came out from from its from its inception i think just uh, for the record we should once more mention that the archive the sunday kubrick archives is uh, based at the uh, um, London um, University, University of the Arts in London. Y you want to add something? Or? <laughs> yeah, sure. Because we have uh, Georgina Orgel and her colleague tonight here with us uh, and we're very pleased and most of our objects from the Jubilee exhibition are, are drawn from the archive. So maybe we have just one short intervention. Mm -hmm. And we're already uh, looking forward, of course, for additional talks about other archives like Simone, uh, who draws a lot of material from the Clark archives, the Arthur C. Clark archives, combining them with uh, the 2001 files in the Kubrick archives, and also, of course, Filippo's upcoming talk in a couple of minutes. Hello, thank you. Um, I was just going to say, um, I agree, it's great to hear the researchers here today saying that it's the community and it's the output from the archive that um, the archive has been able to facilitate and enable over the last 10 years. And um, to encourage people to continue that work um, because the archive is no good to anybody if it just sits in boxes in University of the Arts London at the Elephant and Castle. It needs to be on display as in Tim's exhibition here and, and the larger DFM exhibition and being um, investigated, interrogated, interpreted, used to tell the truth. Um, and that's one of the greatest reasons for the archive to be available to people. And that's what the family and the donors want. So um, I'd encourage anyone here who wants to take that further to get in touch with us. Georgina and I are here this weekend um, from the archive. Um, and we, you can find us on the, on the web and um, you can... Um, Contact us via email to come and visit us, um, 1 till 5, Monday to Friday. Thank you. It's, it's free, uh, by the way. <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs> so maybe 
just to, to wrap that up uh, with the book presentation, of course, I have to mention, um, as we're already here uh, having this wonderful slide, we have such a good bookshop just upstairs. So uh, our museum's bookshop uh, just ordered for the event today some fresh uh, copies, um, hard copies of James's book. And yeah, <laughs> uh, please... Please feel free uh, to ask James and the other contributors um, if you want to buy a copy and uh, have it signed. But uh, just one last question to you, uh, James, as an editor. Um, how would you position the book within the whole um, new publishing um, uh, that is going on in the Jubilee year? So there are so many new publications, uh, so many new approaches also from, from my viewpoint, especially celebrating 50 years of 2001. And... Um, um, I was especially interested in the in the subtitle. So, why did you choose uh, representation and interpretation? Um, I think for the subtitle, it was basically this idea of kind of um, the two standpoints of like textual and kind of philosophical interpretation uh, from kind of like perspectives such as um, sexuality and kind of those kinds of ideas, and then interpretation in terms of kind of archival documents, how we interpret them. I think that's where that came from. Um, in terms of where the book sits within publishing, within Kubrick studies right now, I think it just represents the kind of work that is going off from the archive and also reflects that these two kind of fields of, of thought are coming together and representing that kind of balance uh, between empirical research and kind of much more kind of textual based research. So yeah, I think that's where it sits. It also represents the fact that there is still so much to be written about Kubrick. My mum always says to me, is he yet another book about Kubrick? Haven't you written enough about him? Um, and she's probably right in one respect, but I think this kind of book and um, the likes of Nathan Abrams' books and Peter and so forth and Philip, etc., there is still a lot to be kind of discovered about Kubrick. Um, how these films were made, putting them into kind of the production contexts of cinema history and so forth. And yeah, you're probably going to be getting bombarded by more books as anniversary years come up in the coming years, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, th oh, there's one last question. i just come over to you. Well, what surprises me about the title is the beginning. Uh, understanding Kubrick's uh, sounds sort of like the solution. And so I think it's a very surprising and brave title because I was expecting something like approaches to or t attempts or ways to. So <laughs> that's just the, wha what came to my mind when I saw <laughs> this title. But yes, I think it's very brave. So I mean, <laughs> and of course, um, the expectations are really high now. <laughs> <laughs> it helps, it helps. I think I've read most, I'm sadly not, not finished the, the whole book, I've read most of the chapters, all of them in draft versions. And I think it, it really helped me, me understanding some parts of the movie. The movie is so uh, big in its making, in its production uh, story, in the themes that uh, it conveys to the audience that um, it, the, um, books like that, not only this one, uh, they all help in understanding uh, a little more in every little um, part of this gigantic operation that the movie was. Um, so. Um, Perhaps the grandiose theme of understanding the whole uh, anything in life uh, escapes the scope of the book. But uh, in terms of getting uh, a brick after brick in this um, symbolic wall, I think it manages to do it. Perhaps we need some sort of refund policy. If you don't understand the 2001 <laughs> after reading the book, <laughs> you'll get your money back. <laughs> Okay, I think it's time uh, for a little break now again um, because we have to set up um, the floor for the next talk. Thank you again, James Fanwick, Simona Odino, Filippo Olivieri, and Vincent Jona. Thank you. Thank you, James, for letting this happen. <laughs> <laughs>